This is a production of Cornell University. So I put up the uh, probably what's familiar to all of you, um, probably the most reproduced graph in all of science, which shows the inexorable warming uh, uh, increase in the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, which is warming the climate. And we all know that the source of this carbon dioxide is the burning of fossil fuels, coal and oil and gas. Less familiar to, <clears throat> to many people is how important the role of forests is in the global carbon budget. This is a diagram from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Let's see here. Maybe the arrows on your keyboard, Tim? Not responding. Down at the, yeah. Down at the, perfect. Well, this is a, uh, this is a, a diagram from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I just wanted to point out uh, the role of, of forests in carbon storage and, and flow. These are units of, what are called gigatons of carbon. And in the boxes are the amount of stock of carbon in different parts of the earth. Um, so on the lower left, we see terrestrial ecosystems contain about 2,500 gigatons of carbon. And it's a comparable amount of carbon as is in fossil fuel reserves. So there's a lot of carbon and most of this is in the trees and in the forest soils. Second thing I wanted to point out is the um, important role of deforestation, mostly in the tropical countries, um, in adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, shown on the left side with the arrow, and also the large role of mostly temperate forests in absorbing some of that carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is going up a little bit more slowly than it would be if the forests weren't increasing in their stock. I wanted to begin by just having you think for a moment about a particular forest that's familiar to you. Think about how the forest, say, out in your back 40 or up on the hillside above your, your village or town. Um, where did it come from? How did it get there? Even if it has some big trees in it, you can see some big trees here in an old growth northern hardwood forest. See the person there for scale. Even if it has big trees, it's pro unless you happen to be from the central Adirondacks, it's probably not an old growth forest. That is, it's been cut down in the past and then grown back. So we have second growth or third growth forests throughout most of the Northeast, except a few little pockets of preserves. <clears throat> so most of the Northeastern United States was deforested. Originally, the landscape was entirely covered with trees. Almost 99% of the Northeastern United States would have been forested naturally. One picture is worth a thousand words. This is a picture from Newfield, New York, just south of Ithaca taken in 1870, and you can see the covered bridge down in the lower right there. And all the hillsides are completely deforested. Go to the same location in 2015, there's that same bridge, and there are trees everywhere. So this graph shows the history of changes in the amount of forest land uh, area in the state of New York. As I say, before 1600, it was almost entirely forested. After European settlement, the amount of forest land decreased. The area was logged over. A lot of it was converted to agriculture and pastures, reaching a minimum amount of forest cover around the turn of the 19th, uh, 1900s. Since then, reforestation has occurred on many areas, so that now we have a landscape that's predominantly forested. 
So most of the forests that we have now actually originated about 100 years ago. There are second growth post logging forests like this northern hardwood forest, or forests that have grown back on abandoned fields and pastures like these forests. Most of the forest uh, afforestation of fields and pastures occurred during the early part of the 20th century when marginal agriculture was abandoned. Also in the 1930s, the Civilian Cor Conservation Corps planted a lot of conifers on abandoned agricultural lands. So we have a variety of forests in terms of their age, their composition, the condition of the forest, the history of its management. They all provide a variety of services to society. They're valued for timber, for lumber products, valued for aesthetics and recreation, they're valued for wildlife habitat, for clean water. And now we realize that they're also valuable for storing carbon and in, and in essence, global climate change mitigation. So my objective for this session this morning is to describe for you some general principles regarding this value, this service that's provided by carbon storage in forests. I'm not gonna give you prescriptions for the manager, management of particular forests. I'm not really qualified to do that. I'm an ecologist, I'm like an armchair professor. Many of you are much more expert on forest management than I am. And you know that each parcel that you're thinking about managing requires a specific prescription plan that depends on its condition, its history, its composition, depends on the objectives of the landowners. Rather, what I'm gonna to try to, I'm not gonna give you prescriptions, I'm gonna to try to explain in principle how forests are related to global climate change and carbon mitigation. And hopefully there'll be some useful information for you to apply uh, in a management or a policy context. I thought it might be helpful for you for me to give you a preview of the topics that we'll cover in the order in which they'll be covered. The first one I've already covered, the variety of Northeastern forests. Um, next, I'll make an important distinction between forest carbon stocks and the forest sequestration process. And I'll explain a general principle regarding maximization of climate change mitigation with forests. Then I'll explain how in the absence of management, a developing forest will uh, store carbon and how the sequestration rate will change over time well, under no management. Those forest stocks though are always under some risk of disturbance, natural disturbances. And I'll describe briefly some of the disturbances and what the implications of disturbance are for the permanence of forest carbon stocks. Then I'll give you some general considerations about silviculture and management for climate mitigation and adaptation, followed by a little bit about afforestation of mostly post agricultural deforested land, its potential and some of the challenges there. And I'll end by talking for a bit about forest products. And maybe I'll say a few words about forest woody biofuels, and then I'll give you some take home messages. So that's the sequence you can jump out or jump in uh, as you see fit from, from these topics. We'll cover them over about a 45 minute period. Okay, so first the distinction between forest carbon stocks and forest carbon sequestration rate. So forest carbon stocks defined on the right here are the mass of carbon per unit of ground area, the amount of carbon stored in the trees and in the soils. So it'd be say tons per acre or hectare. About half of the biomass, the dry mass of a tree is carbon. So that's the relationship between biomass or mass of the tree and the, the carbon stock. 
Carbon sequestration is a process. It's the rate at which carbon accumulates in those trees as a result of photosynthetic carbon fixation, incorporating that carbon into the biomass of the tree. A key principle that I'll try to point out a couple of times is the position of durable wood products harvested from a forest as a carbon stock. So this carbon that's harvested from a forest, it's no longer in the forest, but the carbon in those trees is not released to the atmosphere, rather it's in a building or it's in some uh, durable form. Okay, not all of what we harvest from the, uh, from the forest goes into durable products. A lot of it is returned back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide as it breaks down. This is the carbon stock for a typical northern hardwood forest. Jenny mentioned that I work at a place called Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. So this is a forest. It's a fairly typical second growth hardwood forest. It was heavily logged in 1910, so it's about 90 years old, over 90 years old. And the about half of the carbon, a little bit less than half the carbon, is in the living trees. Here it shows 9,000 or so grams of carbon per square meter of ground area and another 2,500 grams of carbon in the roots of the trees. A little over half of the carbon in the forest is in the soil, either on the surface in the organic forest floor or down in the mineral soil. And then there's always some uh, woody debris that lies around <clears throat> slowly decaying. I wanted to say a few words specifically about the soil carbon. Soil carbon is typically more than half of the carbon stored as a stock in a forest around here. However, it's not very dynamic. So it's the brown stuff you see uh, when you dig a hole in the ground. That's a high in soil carbon. But as I say, it's not very dynamic. What I mean by that is that the stock of carbon in the soil changes very slowly. We studied this in some great detail. We studied forest carbon in great detail at Hubbard Brook. Um, when we did a whole tree harvest experiment back in the 1980s. So in the whole tree harvest, you cut down the trees and you take all the wood away, including the tops of the trees. So this is a situation that should have its maximum effect on soil carbon. It's sort of like a worst case scenario for losing soil carbon because for a long period of time, there's no carbon being added and you're losing a lot of carbon. This graphic shows the results of that experiment, as well as some models. First, the two curves there, the blue line and the red dotted line, are simulations using one of the most widely used computer models for projecting changes in soil carbon. We were studying how global climate change might affect soil carbon, and in, maybe in relationship to forest management. So we parameterized these models for Hubbard Brook for which we know a lot of information and then evaluated their performance against the observations. The observations are for this whole tree harvest experiment. So the data here are the dots and the error bars are shown there. So after we cut the forest at time zero, the amount of carbon that we measured in the forest went, soil went down slightly though not statistically significantly after about five years. After 10 or so years, we could actually detect a slight decline in the amount of carbon there. You can see the error bars don't overlap, but then it looked like it had come back by the time you get out to 15 or 20 years. And you can see the models didn't really uh, fit the observations all that well. The point I really most am uh, most making here is that the changes in carbon that are associated with this extreme uh, treatment of whole tree harvest are pretty small. And probably that's a maximum that you would ever see in a treatment. And to measure those stocks changes was an enormous undertaking. We had a crew of, uh, crew of students out there all summer digging pits in the ground and measuring how much carbon was in the soil in each of those pits. We had 60 pits that were dug on each date. 
And you can see what the error bars look like. So we could barely detect it. It's very hard to measure precisely. So from the standpoint of accounting for carbon, it's probably not a good idea to require for auditing purposes, the measurement of soil carbon changes. They're gonna be small and <clears throat> they're gonna be hard to, hard to measure. Which brings me to a key principle which is shown in bold on the upper right here. Well, I won't read through it, but the key point here is that any carbon that's not in the forest is in the atmosphere, trapping heat. All the time that carbon dioxide molecule is up there in the atmosphere, it's trapping heat. So the goal is from forest management standpoint, to maximize the total stock of carbon through time, to keep as much carbon as possible in the trees and in the forest through time. But we would include in this stock the harvested products that go into durable products like buildings, like that log cabin. Now this is kind of a simplified view of things and it's complicated by one important clarification, and that is what time? How long should we be thinking about? It says time integrated, time integrated over what time horizon? You can make a pretty good case that the carbon stored in a forest today and in the near future is more valuable than it will be in the long distance uh, future. Basically, the reason for this is that most people are technological optimists. That human ingenuity by the end of this century or in the next century sometime is gonna come up with solutions to climate change that are safe and cheap. They're not available now. And so anything that we do now to, make, to keep carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is more important to us than keeping carbon in, in the dioxide out of the atmosphere at the end of the century. We're all gonna have cold fusion packs in our back pocket by the end of the century. You can see that this is somewhat to somewhat uh, 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 a subjective judgment. If you're an optimist about technology, that's what you'd say. If you're a pessimist about technology, you'd say, well, it's gonna be just as important in the future. Um, this though has an influence on your carbon management, on the planning for carbon, the fact that, my claim that carbon is more valuable in the short run in the forest than in the long run. Maybe a bit controversial, but and I'm happy to address questions on that at the end. Next, I'm gonna go through, in the absence of management, when a forest is growing back after being disturbed, how the carbon stocks would be expected to change. So after logging or after a blowdown. This is a graph in which the vertical axis shows the carbon sequestration rate, the rate at which carbon is accumulating in the forest through time. So it's the rate of stock change. At the beginning, right after the forest has been logged over or blown down, um, this, we had a, we had a <clears throat> microburst event at Hubbard Brook that knocked down about 100 acres of forest. I'm glad I wasn't out there, it must have been terrifying but all the trees were knocked down over about a hundred uh, hectare area, hundred acre area. <clears throat> so initially those trees are decomposing and adding CO2 to the atmosphere. So the sequestration rate is negative. The forest is a carbon source. But after about 25 years, the trees are not growing back fast and much of their organic matter is decayed and the forest will accumulate carbon at a faster and faster rate for several decades, usually peaking at around age 50, 75, maybe 100 years, depending on the site, species composition or what have you. After that, the sequestration rate will go down until it approaches zero, maybe typically around here, maybe at 150 or 170 years of age. At that point, we reach a condition so-called carbon saturation. There's no additional carbon accumulating 
at that location because the trees are still growing, but trees are dying and decomposing as fast as the trees that are there are growing. I want to give you an example from a particular forest, fairly typical for, this, for, the, for our region. It's the Arnott Forest, which is a several thousand acre <coughs> forest, forested area owned by Cornell, um, just south of Ithaca. It was heavily logged over in the late 19th century. And in the early 20th century, some Cornell professors set up some permanent plots in that forest and measured all the trees. So we can calculate how much carbon there was in that oh, roughly 40 year old forest in the year 1933. And the forest hasn't been managed since. When I arrived in the 1980s at Cornell, I found the records for these stands and we went out and relocated the plots and tagged all the trees in, in uh, 25 or so one acre plots. And we've measured them six times since. So you can see those green dots are the measurements. So the forest has been accumulating carbon and roughly doubled between 1930s and 1980s when I arrived. <clears throat> the red dotted line shows the trend for a computer model projecting the carbon stocks in the trees through time. And you can see it works very well. It almost perfectly matches the observations. And so we can make an expectation or a projection of the future carbon stock as it will change over the next 50 or 70 years. And it'll reach a peak sometime in the late 20th, 21st century. So the carbon stock is large and slightly increasing still through the century. On the other hand, the carbon sequestration rate in the absence of management is decreasing. So the forest is approaching carbon saturation by the end of the century. So we will have this large carbon stock with a slower, smaller sink strength. That carbon stock isn't guaranteed to be here at the end of the century because it could be affected by natural disturbances. And so I'll just say a few words about permanence of forest carbon stocks and risks to forest carbon, that permanence. The risks to the security of forest carbon stocks are from natural forces like forest fires. They're not very important in the Eastern United States, much more important out West because it's so wet around here. <clears throat> the ones that are important to us are storms, severe storms and pests and pathogens. Severe storms like this microburst storm. So that carbon in that forest was holding a lot but it's not fully secure. And many of you remember the ice storm that came through in 1998, caused a lot of damage to the forest, killed a lot of trees, impermanence of that carbon stock. Even more important than strong storms are native pests and introduced pests and pathogens like the forest tent caterpillar that on a sequence, uh, on a interval comes back um, and defoliates the trees, causes a lot of mortality, natural disturbance affecting the security of forest carbon stocks. We're all familiar probably with some of the more virulent introduced pests. The trees don't have much resistance to forces like the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is now killing hemlock trees all over the Northeastern United States. Now we're all hearing about emerald ash borer and seeing the emerald, uh, seeing the white ash trees dying all over the Northeast United States, beech bark disease, which has been here for quite a long time. The Arnott forest trajectory that I showed you is subject to these disturbances. We have the second most abundant tree in the forest is ash. So those ash trees are pretty much all gonna die. That carbon is gonna be released into the atmosphere. So my trajectory, did not take into account emerald ash borer. It did not take into account beech bark disease. Which brings me to the subject of silviculture for climate change <clears throat> mitigation and adaptation. What can we do in terms of management for global climate change mitigation and adaptation? 
The objectives of silviculture are many, but the, probably the two foremost ones are to manage the forest for two reasons. To facilitate the regeneration of desired species. And second, by cutting some of the trees, funnel the growth potential of the site into the most valuable trees. Well, that's going to benefit from the standpoint of timber, and it can also provide a benefit from the standpoint of climate change mitigation and adaptation. I'll illustrate this with a simple conceptual graph. So again, we have on the vertical axis, carbon stocks, the amount stored in the forest uh, through time on a forest developing like the one at Arnott Forest. So in the unthin condition, this is the growth curve that I showed you for the Arnott Forest accumulation of carbon. Carbon will be stored in those stocks in the unthin situation. If you thin the forest and take out some trees, the amount of carbon stock will be reduced. However, the trees that are left behind grow faster and they have better timber quality. And some of the thinnings can go into durable wood products. And so our total carbon sequestration or stock over time, if you add the thinnings to the stock in the forest, can exceed what you would have if you just left the forest unmanaged. Now, next, I'm going to go to a, a tricky case. And this is one that is a common condition confronted by many foresters. Um, some landowner bought a piece of property that the previous owners had, uh, had really degraded by their mismanagement. <clears throat> and it's a tricky case because of the time factor and because uh, if, if climate management is your most important priority, you have a very few options here. You could try to rehabilitate this kind of a site with silviculture, but most forest managers would say, no, no, you'd be better off just to liquidate the whole thing and start from scratch. Or you could just leave it to itself and let it heal. Now, from the standpoint of climate mitigation, that last choice may be best because you get the most carbon there in the short run. Um, if you clear that land, and that carbon goes into the atmosphere. Yeah, in the long run, you're gonna get more carbon on that site, but in the short run, you're gonna have a lot more carbon in the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a tricky case. Um, if that low grade timber has a market in the form of durable products like, ch uh, like chips or as perhaps biofuel, solid biofuel, then, liquidating the carbon capital um, would, could still be a viable climate change mitigation option. Tricky question. <clears throat> the next question is also a tricky one. And this is the fact that climate is warming faster than the trees are able to keep pace. So let's say by the middle of, our, of this century, the climate we have in upstate New York is about the same as what it is now in Virginia. So the climate is changing faster than the trees can migrate. The trees disperse their seeds oh, on the orders of tens of meters, and that's on maybe a 50 year time scale. So they're not gonna be able to keep up with climate change. So silviculture for adaptation to climate change would be planting trees. Now, <clears throat> this is a departure from standard practice. Here, we almost entirely rely in silviculture and in uh, forest management on natural regeneration. It's cheaper and it's dependable and the trees you get are gonna do pretty well under the constant climate around here. But consider the trees in Virginia. Now there's a lot of variation, genetic variation within a species of tree. So the sugar maple trees that are growing in Virginia are better adapted to that climate than they are to the New York climate. Well, if we have the Virginia climate in New York in 50 years, maybe we should be thinking about planting sugar maple seed stock 
seeds or stock from Virginia up into upstate New York. Or on the right, we might even be thinking about expanding the range of southern species farther north. We want to put southern red oak into upstate New York to take advantage of this. This is going to be very risky business. It's a more radical approach to silviculture. And forest, managed, uh, <clears throat> forest uh, researchers can't really give you a concrete answer to this because there are so many uncertainties involved. The similar, the similar um, case applies with regard to afforestation of deforested lands. So a common site around upstate New York, driving down the highway and you see off in the distance, an old pasture that maybe was abandoned 30 or 40 years ago and it's still in the scrub stage. So these persistent scrub stage suppresses the trees. The trees are outcompeted by the shrubs. And this kind of a landscape has much, much lower carbon stock than will a full grown tall forest. Now, eventually, forest is going to grow back in those locations. But again, remember the time factor here. Carbon in the short run is much more valuable in the forest than in the long run. The tricky part of afforestation of post-agricultural lands is that it's expensive. That is, you have to do some kind of site preparation. You have to plant the trees. You have to decide what kind of trees to plant. And then once you've planted those trees, you have to protect them from deer, from rabbits, from other forces that could affect their regeneration. The question of what to plant, we don't have a whole lot of information to go on. I'll give you one example though, and this is an interesting one. In the 19, early 1940s, some soil scientists <coughs> at Cornell planted a whole bunch of plantations, one acre plantations, on some abandoned fields on the hills up above Ithaca. And those trees that have been growing there for 75 years now, they had 10 different species of trees and they had replicated plots. So we've gone back and measured the trees on those plots 75 years later. So I'd invite you to think a little bit for a sec. What do you think? Which species would have accumulated on an abandoned field in Ithaca, New York, would have accumulated the most biomass at the age of 73 years. How would you rank them? I think if I was to have predicted this, I would have guessed red oak. It's a fast growing tree. We're near the middle of its range. Tulip poplar is a, a fast growing big, big tree, but we're kind of towards the north end of its range. Maybe it would be too cold for, for tulip poplar. Sugar maple is a slower growing species. I wouldn't have put it at the top. Conifers grow fast. White pine gets to be really tall, but it's softwood and the wood isn't very heavy. So maybe it wouldn't be white pine. Well, here's the answer. The winner was tulip poplar. These trees are huge. They're, uh, <clears throat> They're now about 140 feet tall at age 75. So they grew really well. Red oak did finish second, so I wasn't that far off. Sugar maple closed. The always spruce was similar. The pines, not so much. So you don't want to plant pine if you want to maximize carbon sequestration on afforested lands. Maybe you want to plant a mix of maybe a couple of oaks and tulip poplar and maybe some slower, slower grows, maybe mix in some spruce. Well, with regard to spruce and the conifers, there's one other consideration here, and that's albedo. So to, to define it, albedo is the reflection of solar radiation by a surface. So if you have a high albedo, then most of the sunlight falling on the surface is reflected back to the sky and doesn't warm the surface or the lower atmosphere. So the higher the albedo, the less warming. So a white colored surface like snow has a high albedo compared with the albedo of a forest. <clears throat> One of our grad students got interested in this and she rigged up a system 
on a drone to be able to, so she put uh, the instruments for measuring the albedo on the drone and then flew it over a bunch of different forests under different snow covers. And these are our observations. So for the open field with a lot of snow on it, 65% of the sunlight is, is reflected on a typical sunny day. It's lower for forest. You know, if you, if you just looked at that, you'd say, well, maybe we want to get rid of all the forests. And then we cool the climate with all those open snow covered fields. <clears throat> Wouldn't be helping us much later in the century when there's any more snow, but, um, and also you, you, you sacrifice all the carbon storage. The difference between a deciduous forest and a conifer forest though is big enough that it's smarter from an afforestation standpoint to plant a deciduous forest, as long as we have a lot of snow cover. There's no leaves on the trees in the winter, and so some of the radiation is reflected uh, by the snow, which shows through compared with the conifer forest. So my conclusion on afforestation is that there's a lot of potential there, and how to facilitate it is a, is a tricky question, and it's going to be expensive. Moving now to the subject of forest products, and I wanted at this point just to acknowledge um, Bob uh, <clears throat> Malsheimer from SUNY ESF, who gave a nice talk on this subject last summer, and I borrowed some of his slides. I hope you don't mind, Bob. Um, <clears throat> so remember, durable forest products contain a lot of carbon. There are two ways in which these forest products then can help address and mitigate climate change. One is that carbon sequestration benefit. There's carbon in the forest products. The second is the substitution benefit. There's much less fossil fuels associated with using wood as a building material than using steel or concrete. Much more fossil fuel emissions. This is an example that Bob pulled out of the literature um, showing the amount of fossil fuels used to make a wood floor compared with a concrete slab floor or a steel based floor. So it's three to five times higher for the non-forest non product. That's the substitution benefit, all the fossil fuel energy that goes into making steel or concrete. Concrete actually is the, in the production produces a lot of greenhouse gases. <clears throat> The subject of mass timber buildings has gotten a lot of attention. This is a relatively new technology you maybe aren't aware of. <clears throat> wood engineers have figured out how to glue and nail together little pieces of wood in a way that makes it very, very strong structural material. So you can now build, build big buildings, multi-story buildings out of wood rather than with steel. So that's a sequestration benefit because of the carbon stored in the building. And there's also a substitution benefit because there's less carbon associated with the fossil fuels in producing the materials, steel and, and cement than in producing wood. <clears throat> the figures are shown here. The substitution benefit for this dormitory at University of Washington um, is about twice the sequestration benefit, but both are a big benefit from the standpoint of carbon climate mitigation. Okay, and I'll finally say a few words about forest biofuels. This is a very complicated issue that would require an entire hour to give it uh, complete coverage. But in principle, forest biofuel, forest-based bioenergy should be a win situation. That is, you burn the carbon dioxide to produce, whether it's heat or electricity in a power plant or in a home, that releases the carbon that was in the trees out into the atmosphere. But in principle, that same amount of carbon is going to be a, so, uh, accumulated in the trees as they grow back. Of course, the time scale is a, is a question. It may, not, it may take 70 years for that carbon that you released instantaneously on burning it to accumulate in the forest. And that's why it's become controversial. 
the problem and the reason for the high controversy associated with force-based bioenergy is that this substitution benefit may be problematic if the sourcing of the carbon is not done correctly. So if the free market is left to itself to provide the carbon, the, the biofuel, the sourcing of the biofuel, and forest carbon stocks get degraded in the process, then, especially in the short run, it's a lose situation. So what it really means is that forest biofuels are capable of being a helpful advantage to climate mitigation, but only if they're very carefully, very strictly regulated. If there was a market for low-grade trees and forest biofuels, it would be eminent sense to liquidate that carbon, chip it up, and use it as a biofuel, and then get a healthy forest growing in its place. So having that market available for low-grade materials would be an advantage from the standpoint of climate mitigation. Unfortunately, the way the, con the forest <clears throat> biofuel market works now is often pe people are cutting down healthy, large trees and turning them into chips. So I'll close with just a quick overview of some of the take home messages I hope you were able to glean from this quick, quick look at forests and carbon management. First, the variety of forests. Every forest is gonna need its own prescription. There's always gonna to need to be expert foresters to provide prescriptions and those prescriptions can include climate mitigation. Second, the difference between carbon stocks and the sequestration rate and what the goal of climate change mitigation should be, which is to maximize, especially in the short run, the time integrated carbon stock including in that carbon stock, any durable products from harvest. Third, those carbon stocks in the preserved forest are always at some risk of impermanence from disturbance by natural forces. And there's nothing we can really do about that. A fourth, silver culture can promote global climate change mitigation. And this can be built into the landowner's objectives and needs, but it's tricky business. The tricky business is with adaptation to a claim, changing climate. Planting and assisted migration is at this point really an uncertain business. Aforestation of post-agricultural land, especially in a place like upstate New York or Pennsylvania, where there's a lot of abandoned agricultural land that's lying fallow now could be a useful activity for the government to provide incentives. And coming up with the best choices of species and sourcing of seed stock and seedlings is, is again, a tricky business. And then finally, sequestering carbon with, for example, mass timber business and substituting uh, forest products for high fossil fuel intensity approaches to, to uh, <clears throat> industry can be a very useful activity from the standpoint of climate benefit. Well, I think I'll uh, leave it there and, and open the floor for questions. Please don't pin me down too much. Thank you so much, Tim. That was fantastic. Um, Peter, I'm going to post the poll. Could you field the first question? Yes. Uh, one question, Tim, was uh, was that 73-year-old plantation study published? Uh, let's see. So that and was not the, the Turkey not Hill. The entire, not the entire study. There is one paper that uh, quantified the carbon the biomass in three of the for three of the species. We'll be publishing the broader analysis uh, sometime in the next year or 
great. There is a question about the CLCPA, which we will reserve uh, until after Brian Ellis speaks, since he'll be talking about policy. Uh, there's a question about, uh, in the case of the degraded forest, uh, what is the opportunity cost in terms of carbon of letting interfering species like invasive shrubs or beech dominate the understory indefinitely versus an aggressive attempt to regenerate to a diverse mix of early successional forests? So my reading of this is, is there a carbon benefit to uh, managing those invasive shrubs or beech in order to get a healthy mixed species forest growing? Yeah, well, usually the, the understory vegetation isn't gonna be a large stock of carbon, uh, whether, it's, whether it's sapling beaches or, sh or shrubs, it'll be only a few percent as large as the carbon stock in the overstory trees. So yes, there may be a small penalty of, as I say, liquidating that without a market, uh, for chips, for example. Um, but there, the short-term benefit would not be so, or the short-term cost would not be nearly as large as in the case of cutting down big, uh, big low-quality trees. Great. And we have a, another question. Uh, if through silviculture, you funnel growth to a single valuable species, you also open yourself up to pests and pathogens being able to flourish more easily because you're concentrating their source of food and energy. The monoculture problem. How do you handle this? Yeah, it's a very good point. And you're kind of stuck with what the particular parcel of, of forest uh, now consists of. The, the landowner wanting to maximize his income in the short run uh, would want to put that growth into the most valuable trees, and it might only be one species, but then he's going to be at the risk of, as you say, um, hemlock. Well, you decided to favor hemlock and you get hemlock, or you decided to favor white ash and then all the ash trees die. So it is a bit risky. It is, it is a riskier proposition. From a climate management standpoint, um, the implication would, would be analogous. That is, if those trees die and there's not a market for those trees. At this point, there's a lot of salvage going on of white ash and turning it into uh, durable forest products. So maybe the industry is always going to be capable of reacting to these kinds of events. Thanks. So another question is about alternatives to wood. Uh, so lately, I keep hearing people say that growing hemp for paper and construction materials has greater carbon benefits than growing trees for paper. Have you looked at this at all? I don't see how it can be true myself. Well, it would, that, that would ignore the climate benefit of the carbon in, in the uh, stock of the vegetation. So from the standpoint of growing fast, of growing, quickly growing um, a paper product, uh, hemp might be favorable, but it's not gonna be ever gonna be storing much carbon in, the, uh, in, the, in that stock. And that any carbon that's not on the, in the stock on that land is not storing carbon. That carbon is in the atmosphere now. You sh certainly wouldn't wanna convert a, a large forest to a hemp plantation in the, with the aim of, of climate mitigation. Great. And then there's a question about biochar. How does biochar figure into the potential for storing carbon long-term, especially thinking about dead ash trees? Good question. So the production of the biochar does result in some carbon emissions. And then the carbon in the biochar is pretty well preserved, depending on how the biochar is made, is pretty well preserved for, uh, at least for moderate time scales, for say a decadal or century time scale. Um, so there is considerable potential for taking advantage of, of biochar as a product. 
when, when forest fires go through, they create a lot of biochar. So some of the carbon from that forest is preserved in the charcoal that was created by the fire, uh, but not nearly as much as is released uh, as CO2 by the burning. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.